All right. So this is part one of a two part series. I think the second part is in, in late October. And so we'll explore a couple of topics, but there's a couple of points here where I'm going to pause and ask a question. So I'd love it if uh, someone could could shout out and, and answer. And we'll just go through a couple of things here. I'll, I'll go for about 30 minutes and we'll pause for questions and answers for about 25 minutes or so. So I study the agricultural economics at North Dakota State University and have been con a kind of a continuing to study economics ever since, if you will, especially as an entrepreneur. And there's some basic principles that I would I want to go through really quick with economics and what I would call economics 101 that I've learned to be true uh, over and over again. And I think it's fascinating. So what we're going to do today is I'm not going to give you any opinion. I'm only going to give you data and talk through a couple things. So first of all, I've learned that you always get more of whatever you subsidize. So in general, any kind of government or economic system or market mechanism, this holds true. So I'm going to pause there for just a second to let that sink in. And the opposite is true. You get less of whatever you tax. So more of whatever you subsidize, less of whatever you tax. This generally economics, there's tons of content in literature about behavioral economics of how we act and behave based on economic incentives. It's sort of human nature. Here's another thing that I've learned. The collective wisdom of the masses of the free market in the US is far smarter than Capitol Hill, is far smarter than any body of, of legislators, far smarter than any, you know, Capitol Hill analysts, far smarter than any policy think tank that is trying to create policy. So in general, everyone will figure out what they're going to do and how to do it. And in most cases, what this means then, because of this collective wisdom, is that regulation always has unintended consequences always. And uh, oftentimes you'll hear about, you know, loopholes and so forth. I believe the um, the U.S. tax policy is over 100,000 pages and it's regulation upon regulation upon regulation trying to close loopholes or come up with new ways of taxing and it's an entire industry that's well over a hundred billion dollar industry of CPAs and tax experts and lobbying efforts. And it would be, it would be so the more regulation we add, the more unintended consequences and the more complex everything gets, and the more expensive it is to actually collect taxes and then redistribute. So those are a couple of key principles that I want everyone to keep in mind. You get more of what you subsidize, you get less of what you tax. The uh, the masses will always outsmart the uh, the government and find you know ways around and runs, if you will, ways around. And uh, there's always unintended consequences. And I'll, I'll I'll just tell a couple of stories that are kind of funny. So uh, last year, or maybe it's a year and a half ago, there was a gun buyback program. Now I don't set aside what you feel about guns for a moment. Just, I want you to focus on the economics and the behavior. So Utica, New York Police Department, you know, part of the New York State Attorney General effort offered $500 for every gun that was turned in to the police department. So what do you think happened? Well, a, a young man who had a $200 3D printer that he got for Christmas from his parents quickly made 110 gun parts. He he read the buyback and it said even a gun lower. So he made really simple like ceramic lowers for, for a pistol and just cranked out 110 of them, went into the police department, opened up his bag, threw them on the counter and collected. And then they said, oh, we, we can't possibly pay you 500. <laughs> That's way too much. They negotiated and they paid him $21,000. So um, it was completely an unintended consequence. But, you know, it's one of those situations where anybody with an entrepreneurial spirit could have gone to any gun store and bought any gun for less than $500, taken them over to the police station, sold them for $500, and made money. And again, this is completely unintended. 
but that's an example of a buyback program or any kind of economic incentive, any kind of regulation backfiring because of those unintended consequences and because the, the masses of the free market will figure out how to maximize the situation. Here's one that's really, really interesting. In Delhi, India, under British rule, uh, the, the Brits weren't too keen on cobras. Uh, the Indians were used to cobras. And if you've ever been face, you know, face to face uh, up against a cobra, it is frightening when they flare their hood and they're obviously very poisonous. So this sounds like a good idea, right? Uh, to have a bounty. So what do you think happened? Does anybody want to shout out an answer? What do you think happened when you have a bounty for dead cobras? Somebody started breeding them. <laughs> yes. Indians bred cobras for the income. And so it was like, wow, we get, we're going to make money off of the Brits, right? Okay. So now what do you think happened? The Brits aren't stupid. The program was scrapped, right? So now what do you think happened? All those worthless cobras were set free. And, and after it was all done, the wild cobra population around Delhi was even much higher than it was before the program. Obviously not, you know, what the government, in this case, the Brits were expecting. But this is this is to illustrate the point of unintended consequences of regulation. And and so already you're probably thinking, oh, I'm a, you know, um, free market capitalist that believes in less government. But in general, less government is better because in human nature, we'll typically do whatever we can do to optimize the situation. This was dubbed by a German economist as the Cobra effect. Now, unfortunately, most people on Capitol Hill, I don't care what side of the aisle, most people on Capitol Hill are not aware of the Cobra effect <laughs> or do a very good job of writing legislation. But in general, this is, a, this is an economic principle that is really good to learn and to carry through life with you. And again, core principles, right? The more you subsidize, the, the more you get, the more you tax, the less you get, et cetera. So let's talk about capitalism, socialism, and communism for a second. So the overarching goals are pretty clear. Capitalism, you know, it's the American dream. It's all about upward mobility. It's It doesn't matter how you were born, what circumstances you were born into, there's an opportunity hopefully for everyone to create wealth, to get education, to move up. And the main thing is not, there's no classism like there is in a lot of societies in America. The American dream is you can land on our shore with $10 in your pocket. And if you work hard, you can get ahead. And the whole idea is everyone has an opportunity for wealth creation and for private ownership. And it's a free market. Now, we're not always, capitalism is not always ideal. We, we, we've made a lot of mistakes as a country, but in general, that's what capitalism is all about. Let people have the opportunity to work hard, to own a business, start a business, create wealth, and it's a free market. Anytime you muck with the market mechanism, you have those unintended consequences like we just were talking about. So socialism is all about equality through redistribution. And I would say that except for the ruling class in every socialistic environment and every communistic environment, there's always people in charge and like the Russian oligarchs and they're the, they're the billionaires and they're walking on, you know, the, the, the rest of the people, if you will. So that's the, that's the thing to be careful about with socialism and communism is it sounds really good on face of it, right, that, hey, we're all going to be treated equally, we all have, you know, equal outcomes, etc. cetera. Um, with socialism, it's kind of like socialism and communism are, are very closely related. And I would say it all has to do with sort of the amount of state ownership versus private ownership. Uh, with socialism, there's a mix of private and state ownership, and, but the state controls many things. In communism, the state owns everything, the state controls everything, and it's completely classless. So that's kind of the overarching goals. So for capitalism, it's really all about, you know, firms invest in innovation and efficiency because you're competing for customers, right? It's like uh, the ability for Tesla to actually create an automobile 
in an industry, an auto industry that everyone thought was mature and everyone thought was large scale, you know, uh, economically, it made no sense that a startup could enter into a, a very mature industry with multi-billion dollar companies and compete. But yet that's what capitalism is all about. It's about entrepreneurs coming up with a better idea. Uh, it's faster, cheaper, better and competing for customers. This always ends up with better products, better services, lower prices, and more choice. And that was kind of the title of this presentation. With capitalism, ideally, and it's nothing's ever ideal, you know, <laughs> there's always government intervention, there's always issues, there's always mistakes. But in general, this is how capitalism works and how a free market economy works. And as an entrepreneur right now, I've got several startups underway. I've invested in a lot of startups. The thesis is always to invest in a founder, you know, an entrepreneur with a better idea and to give them capital so they can build that idea. They can employ people and try to create something, a value proposition that is far better than what is out there. And what you get is you get a lot more innovation, a lot more efficiency. And as consumers, we get way more choice and better products. Now, socialism, the state allocates resources based on political priorities. Uh, there's there's really not much of a profit motive because you're you're taking it away, you're distributing that to others, your uh, the state owns much of everything. So obviously then innovations reduced, um, uh, work effort is reduced. You get lower products and lower lower quality services. And here's <laughs> this is like a funny thing that always go makes its rounds on social media. But it's, you know, it, it's kind of it really wraps up the difference between the three. And and it, it's uh, I'll just let you read. It. I won't read it to you. But, yeah, the whole idea of capitalism is, hey, grow your herd. Right. Make money. You have a profit motive. The harder you work, the more money you can make. Socialism is, hey, we're going to take your cow and give it to the neighbor or you're going to share the milk equally. Communism, stand in line. And the problem with communism was always, if it's a command economy, or like in Russia for decades, they would they would at, you know, the headquarters level, try to dictate, you know, how many cars to make, how many washer and dryers to make. You were told what you had to study because they they were planning in a planned economy or command economy. You're trying to plan for what skill sets you need, and so and again. You can't ever regulate properly in a command economy. You, you can't ever meet the needs of the masses. But with capitalism, it's a demand economy. If consumers demand lower prices or higher quality, you know, then then there's an opportunity to deliver that and to create a profit out of that. But there's criticisms of all three, right? With capitalism, people often point to wealth inequality. The rich get richer, the poor remain poor. Um, you're exploiting the environment or exploiting, uh, you know, labor. And there's boom and bust cycles. You, you almost can't help that with capitalism. And what, what oftentimes what drives boom and bust is, hey, if if uh, right now AI software is really big, everybody's jumping into AI, lots of investment. There's oftentimes you have then a glut of AI companies, way too many. And it leads kind of boom and bust. So whether it's real estate or a particular uh, type of value proposition, you often see boom and bust cycles. It kind of comes with that, right? Because everybody piles into, um, you know, if if someone can make a whole bunch of money doing something, they're going to have a lot of copycats. Uh, socialism, it's reduced incentives, inefficient, oftentimes economic stagnation. Communism, um, you know, it's authoritarian. There's no autonomy, really inefficient and the complete lack of innovation. So there's criticisms of all these, but in general, there's sort of a struggle right now in America of, and it's really not communism, it's more of a, how much should we move into socialism, right? And a lot of that is around income inequality and, and that kind of thing. It's really about um, outcomes. Now, let me talk about income inequality. So an employee's wage is a mutual agreement between an employee and an employer. No one's holding a gun to anyone's head, forcing them to work for a certain wage. So anytime I see in the news that there's a, a huge issue with income inequality, inequality, it's like, well, 
but no one forced them to work for that wage. And sometimes an employee will find out how much another employee is getting paid and get all mad. Well, but there's no forcing here. So if you want to improve your income, you know, there's plenty of ways of doing that. But I wanted to just sort of set the stage that because socialism is all about income equality, um, let's just explore a couple of tenets that are really critical. And really, income has to do with unequal performance. The value of an employee is their performance. It's their capability, you know, gifting, skills, experience, education, their character, work ethic, honesty, punctuality, et cetera. And um, I've employed thousands and thousands of employees. And it's really, you end up over time paying different employees differently based on performance. And it's a performance, and that's really goes back to free market. If we think as an employee is selling their time to their one customer, their employer, um, and you have to be the best vendor, if you will, to that customer, and the, the better you perform, the more you make. Um, that's just kind of how it works. So focusing on income equality is the wrong focus because equal opportunity is what we should be about, right? Everyone, and this is the whole American dream, everyone should have the opportunity, ideally, to get ahead. Like, I mean, like the introduction, yeah, I was born in extremely poor circumstances, a dirt floor basement where we raised chickens and pigs and, uh, you know, with a, a Mennonite background with no electricity, telephone, television, running water, anything. Um, so how how could it be? How could I turn out the way I did? Well, uh, you know, I was really blessed with many opportunities and and just the fact that normally you wouldn't see that in most countries and in most contexts, you wouldn't see this you know, kind of rags to riches sort of story, but we see it in America all the time. That is the American dream. So what we want to hang on to is the American dream of equal opportunity. Everyone can get ahead. It's it's all about upward mobility. It's the ability to move up, to gain more, gain more education, work harder, gain wealth, et cetera. So income equality is trying to have an equal outcome, which is the wrong goal because you'll never have an equal outcome. That, that That's being unfair to those that performed better. That's the one part of the equation that all of us are individually responsible for. So if we're trying to say everyone should get paid the same, then performance doesn't matter. So that's, that's the same with all of you who are students. All of you are tr striving for good grades and a high GPA, right? But if you all, if, if all everybody that got an A, you know that that grade was average with everyone that got a, a C or a D, then why even try, right? So equal outcome doesn't make any sense because if we have a profit motive, if we have the opportunity to work hard and get ahead, but then that gets taken away from us, then that is, that's what's unfair. Warren Farrell made a funny quote, you know, saying, oh, hey, if, if women are making 15% less than men, that's all I would hire. Why not? I would just increase my profits by 15%. And so there's oftentimes we hear sound bites by politicians. You know, there's a there's a gender gap with women or a, a pay gap or wage gap between blacks and whites. And just with again, setting politics aside, let's just dig into the data. So Claudia Golden is a Harvard University professor and economist, and um, she just she really did a lot of analysis and just said, look, it's really about work choices and flexible work arrangements. And so uh, oftentimes women will step out of the workforce, have a family, or uh, want to leave early to uh, take care of children, pick them up from daycare, and they kind of work it out with, with, with the family. They work it out with their husbands, and it's a decision, or they stay at home, and there's no income. And so it's almost the entire gender pay gap is usually explained by really digging into the data. So whenever you hear the soundbite about gender pay gap, that's we should never settle for that. We should demand better analysis. I'll give you an example. Um, female tutors get paid 44% more than male tutors. I went to the, the, the um, 
the U.S. government data sites and dug up, you know, some some data, which is really interesting. Um, so does that mean that we should then lower the wage of female tutors to that of male tutors or that we should demand higher pay for male tutors? Um, I had I had this discussion with one of my daughters when she was a teenager. And at the time, I had a company where I had 10 region presidents. Nine were men, one was a female. The female had been with me longer and had the biggest region, and she got paid the most money. And so, so my daughter was talking about the gender pay gap, and I said, well, so what would you recommend that I do? Do I lower the compensation for my one female region president to what the men are on average, or do I increase the men's to what hers is? And why would I do that? She runs the largest region, and she's the most experienced, and she's worth the, worth the most. And I pay her the most, right? So in general, again, if there's a market mechanism to attract really good workers, we have to pay them what they're worth and how they perform. No one is sitting there that I know of. I've never met another business owner that would say, I'm going to purposely pay women less. Now, there's a couple of things. One, I was a, I was a, um, a investment banking you know, broker dealer for a number of years. The, the biggest disparity on gender pay gap is in security sales, according to the, the Bureau of Labor uh, stats. Uh, male security salesmen, like investment banking sales brokers, make 55% more than women. What's interesting is almost all of that compensation, two thirds or three fourths of it is all bonus driven. So when I was at Harvard Business School, and we all, you know, graduated with the same degree, an MBA from Harvard. And if, you know, those that went to Wall Street and those that went to consulting like I did, we all got exactly the same base pay. Everybody went to Goldman Sachs that got an offer out of my class, all got exactly the same base pay. But then there's bonuses. And then how hard you work, how many hours you put in, how good you are with customers, how good of a salesperson you are, that drives the bonus. So the problem with most of the analysis, it's it's a very light analysis that stays at too high of a level to go, okay, if the most egregious gender pay gap is security sales, but almost all of the compensation is bonus driven. And I've I've worked in investment banking. I mean, you you are very careful about bonuses. You pay bonuses based on deals made and deals done and deals performed and deals closed. And you, you know, you want to pay the most bonus to the to the biggest producer. And so what I would suggest is that it's not about gender. It's really about a work arrangements and different jobs. And uh, in most cases, women prefer different career choices than men. And oftentimes those career choices earn less. But what's really interesting is to look at the data, to look at the actual, you know, kind of career choices. And then the pay differences, and it's it's all it all it almost completely goes away if you just do the analysis. Here's so there's several think tanks that have said this similar thing. This happens to be a quote from Brookings Institute that of uh, you know three things: graduate high school, get a full time job, wait until marriage to have children. Ninety percent of everyone there there no there's not college in here. It's just high school, full-time job, wait until marriage to have children. 97% are middle class or higher. So that would suggest finishing, you know, a couple of things, working hard, like finish high school, working hard, and, and don't have children out of wedlock. So when we talk about income inequality, there's other factors at play. Robert Cherry is a University of Texas professor in economy. He said, literally, there's no wage gap between black and white Americans that were both raised in a nuclear family where they had a mom and a dad. There's there's literally, it's, they have the same income. So a lot of people talk about, you know, the black wage gap. And he, he basically came out and said, it's actually a marriage gap. If you're born into a nuclear family, you have a mom and dad that love you and, and encourage you. And then it doesn't matter what the income level is of the mom and the dad. What matters is that that child had an encouraging set of parents that work together to raise them up and encourage them. And they'll they'll basically have the same income. 
In fact, what's uh, <laughs> what's interesting is I, I looked into the data, 22 ethnic groups in America out-earn white Americans. 22 ethnic groups. This isn't black versus white. This isn't male versus female. Uh, in fact, American Indian, Indian Americans, uh, I should say, earn, uh, you know, double what European Americans make. The typical, you know, what's considered white Americans, double. Um, you know, the ethnic groups, you know, are, includes, you know, Nigerians, Pakistanis, Filipinos, Taiwanese, Chinese. I mean, this, this isn't about white versus black, male versus female. There's something else going on here. The data clearly shows that. And it's almost solely explained by culture, character, and competence. So one of my startups, I have we have eight employees, two are Nigerians, and then we have uh, six contractors. All six are Nigerians. All of those eight Nigerians of that eight-person team plus six contractors, 14 total, eight out of 14, they're all hardworking. They're all smart. They all earn a really good living. And I, I asked one of the guys that works uh, for me, and I said, what, what is it about Nigeria that, you know, you guys all work so hard and out earn, you know, the average American. And it's, he, he, he said his culture. He said, growing up in Nigeria, it's just everybody worked hard. Everyone wanted to, you know, own something and, and, you know, own your home and, you know, um, start a company. There's a cultural aspect to income and to wealth creation. And then of course there's the character aspect, right? How hard do you work? Do you show up on time? And then there's the competence. How skilled are you? How highly educated are you? And so it's literally everything about income equality is explained by culture, character, and competence. The family you grew up in. A lot of the successful entrepreneurs that I've invested in grew up in an entrepreneurial family. Their parents were entrepreneurs, et cetera. So here's a typical warning sign at federal and state parks. You know, don't feed the wildlife. Animals may become dependent on handouts. It's called a welfare dependency. So if we remember, whatever we subsidize, we get more of. So if we just take money away from producers and give it to non-producers and stifle innovation and stifle competition, you end up like this. So um, Germany, 1978, there's a BMW. On the lower left, Russia, 1978, it's a Lada automobile. Now, Germany, you know, uh, demand economy, build what consumers want, build better cars. Russia, command economy. We're going to produce so many cars and you're going to like it. And if you don't get a car, you have to stand in line and wait. Uh, I think in 1978, you had to wait at least two years to get a car because they had limited production and they didn't listen to demand. It was just a command economy. Someone decided, you know, um, how many cars to produce that year. So let's go to 2009, upper right. Wow, that's what BMW turned into. Innovation, what consumers wanted, really slick looking design. Uh, what about Lada? Exactly the same, stamp them out. Don't, the, the, the market didn't drive innovation. Innovation wasn't rewarded. There was no profit incentive. The government owned a lot of factories and forced the workers, you're going to be a welder, you know, you're going to be a mechanic, told them what they had to study, and that's what you end up getting. Uh, you know, socialism and communism stifles innovation. Margaret Thatcher, the former prime minister of, of the UK, had this fabulous quote in Parliament. The problem with socialism, you eventually run out of other people's money. So the socialism is really taxing producers and subsidizing non-producers. It's basically saying the more money you make, the more we're going to take, and we're going to give it to those that make less. And it's really, if I go back to, again, it's about culture, character, and competence. I'm calling those producers. So if you're a high producer that comes from a culture of you know wanting to make money, wanting to own uh, something, wanting to create wealth, working hard, getting educated, et cetera, and then be intact. So we're going to get less production and more non-producers, right? Whatever you tax, you get less of. Whatever you subsidize, you get more of. And this is a problem with socialism. And so let's look at some data really quick. So this is the growth in per capita gross domestic product. So in other words, the sort of average income <clears throat> per capita per person in South Korea, 1980 to 2000. 23. 
and look at the differences here in, or in terms of the growth of per capita GDP. In other words, upward mobility, if you will. Now, South Korea, Singapore, Israel, and the US are all capitalistic. So is Iceland, Denmark, Norway, Finland, and Sweden. Now, a lot of times you'll hear people say, well, that's a social democracy. They're really, they're socialist. No, they're not. Socialism, again, <clears throat> is where the state owns much of the business, much of production. Um, there is there's none of that in the Nordic countries. They do have high tax rates. And it's... So there is high taxes, but it's still private ownership. There's still a profit motive. And I've been to all those countries. I've I've been in the homes of, um, in fact, the, the CFO of the largest company in Norway had me in his home, dinner with his family. And we were literally talking about taxes. And, and, they, and then his company owned a lot of companies in the U.S. And we, we talked a lot about that. But um, it's still all private ownership in Nordic countries. They just have a, a, a slightly higher tax rate. Now, what's interesting is um, it's not that much higher than the U.S., but it is higher. Sweden, at the bottom of the list there of Nordic countries, has the highest tax rate among Nord Nordic countries. And you literally kind of see that that difference. Uh, you can see Russia and Venezuela. Venezuela is kind of the, the only one on this list that's a true socialistic uh, setup in their, in their economy. And their economy actually shrunk on a per capita basis over all these years. So here's what's really interesting when you do the correlation <clears throat> is that the GDP growth per capita is highly correlated with long-term capital gains tax. <clears throat> so what is long-term capital gains? That's a tax on if I invest in a startup today and 10 years later I sell that startup, that's a long-term gain. <clears throat> it's more than 12 months and I'm taxed on that gain. Right now, this is money that the money that I invest, I've already paid taxes on. I've already paid personal taxes on earning that money. But the government in the US thinks it's wise that even though I've already paid tax on that money, if I invest that money and make more money on that, I should pay tax on the gain. That's what long term capital gains tax is. Right. So, again, whatever you tax, you get less of. So the more I tax capital gains, I'm going to get less investment. And that's not how you grow an economy. You need investment to grow an economy. And so <clears throat> there's a bit of a problem there. Now, if I look at these countries, what I basically did was I looked at South Korea and Singapore. And Singapore, by the office, I have an office in Singapore. I have uh, people in Singapore that I work with. I've, I've been there for a while. I love Singapore. Singapore has, <clears throat> look at the 16.2x. Look at South Korea. Singapore has no um, um, tax on capital gains. Singapore says, we want you to invest. So it's zero. We don't charge any tax on that. So this, this is Singapore and South Korea here. So And then this is the US and the Nordic countries. So basically what you have, the higher the capital gains tax rate, the less the growth of the economy, the lower the tax rate, the higher the growth. So I just took these countries and plotted them on here. Now, if you study statistics at all, you know that an R square of 0.44 is, R square is all about the goodness of the fit. So we have this, this regression line. And so this is a really strong correlation and a strong fit. <clears throat> so clearly it's an economic principle we go back to. Whatever you tax, you get less of. <clears throat> and in this case, lower the tax. So South Korea only has a 10% capital gains tax, for example. In the US, it's 20%. In other countries, it's higher. In Nordic countries, it's higher. So uh, lower the tax, you get more investment. More investment means more jobs and you grow the economy. It's really that, quite simple. <clears throat> this is what Adam Smith, the father of modern economics, uh, would say. A free market is based on self-interest. It's a profit motive. It's working hard. It's getting the heads, private ownership. We've talked about that. But it works best when the participants act with virtue and moral integrity. So we have a couple problems with capitalism, right? <clears throat> uh, when companies exploit workers, when companies exploit the environment because they want to make more money. So they uh, they they you know want to maybe cheat employees and that led to unionization and so forth, right? So the downside of capitalism is usually the exploitation issue. So I think I've demonstrated with data that 
the, the income equality issue, um, we shouldn't worry about that with capitalism because everyone has an opportunity in a free market to work hard, get ahead, make more money in upward mobility. But if a company is too powerful and exploits workers or doesn't do the right thing, uh, it, it basically doesn't act like Adam Smith said with virtue and moral integrity. Other founding fathers said the free market or capitalism only works inside a Christian ethic if we care about people and do the right thing. So if that's the one downside of capitalism, we shouldn't just raise the taxes and, and you know give that away. In other words, tax the producers and, and subsidize non-producers. What we should do is do the right thing. So how do we encourage virtue and moral integrity with, within capitalism? <clears throat> There's a wonderful book that was written several years ago called Firms of Endearment. Great name. <laughs> and these are companies that are earning large profits because they do the right thing. So if you talk about stakeholders, it's sort of like everybody, right? Your customers, employees, investors, partners, communities, society. It's like everybody that is affected by a company. So a couple of PhD professors did this research on publicly traded companies, and they identified 22 companies that really, really did care about all their stakeholders that did the right thing. In many cases, the employees, it was an ESOP employee owned company. Funny things happen when the employees are all owners, right? In terms of how much you care. All of my startups, the employees are all, all have a stake in the startup's outcome. And, and most startups operate that way. Everyone gets options, everyone has ownership, and that's what, that's what you want, right? But this, uh, <clears throat> this research was 22 publicly traded companies. They called value-based companies or firms of endearment. Those 22 companies outperformed over a period of 15 years by 14.2x. So this is stunning. What this says is capitalism, capitalism works really well, but it works far better if you really do care and reward properly your, your employees, your customers, your community, and society. And so, yes, capitalism has some warts, but we don't want to throw away the baby with the bathwater. We know that capitalism works better than anything else. The data clearly shows that. Uh, you can easily grow an economy much better with capitalism, better products and services, better everything, upward mobility, opportunity for wealth creation, et cetera. We have to accept that some people will work harder than others, do a better job than others, have better character, more competence, came from an entrepreneurial culture, and they're going to out-earn. We have to be comfortable with that because you'll, you're will you going to have that in a society where we're all free to do what we want to do to maximize our outcome. But these companies that did the right thing, like Adam Smith was talking about, uh, that, that acted with virtue and moral integrity so far outperformed that this is, this is really interesting and something we really have to dial into. <clears throat> so... My next presentation on October 25th is part two, where I'm going to talk about what I learned as an investor in well over 100 companies of investing for impact and maximizing social change by investing in for-profit companies. So think of this as I want to achieve all those results of raising people up out of poverty, extending health care to the poor, combating human trafficking. But I want to do it in a way through a capitalistic lens and through these capitalistic principles, which would suggest that I can build better products, provide better services at a lower cost while having impact. And so I'll pause there for questions. You mentioned how they had talked about taxing unrealized capital gains. How, how do you feel about that? Oh, yes. That would be horrible. So we've already demonstrated with the data that taxing actual long-term gains will reduce investment. And by lowering that tax or going to zero, that you greatly grow an economy, like we saw with South Korea and Singapore. Unrealized gains means you actually haven't sold that startup yet. So let's say that you take a job as, as a startup 
let's say you come to work for me in one of my startups and I give you some equity and it's priced at a dollar a share. We, you work hard, I work hard, the rest of the team works hard, and we grow that company. We do another financing. Uh, we have a venture capital firm that invests, and now we're valued at $5 a share. And let's say that you got 10,000 shares. So the, the government would say, oh, you just had a gain of $4 a share. That's $40,000. Now, we haven't sold the company yet. You haven't realized that. It's just all on paper. Uh, in fact, we still are very risky. We're a tech startup. It, in all likelihood, we might fail, right? Because most startups do fail. But you get hit with a tax bill for $40,000 of unrealized gain. That's what it means. You haven't realized it yet. It's just on paper. But now you're going to pay taxes on that. Now that plus your base salary is going to push you into the highest tax bracket, which is 32%. So you're going to get a tax bill from the IRS for over $12,000 that you haven't earned, you haven't cashed in. How do you come up with $12,000? It's like, why would we ever do this? And then what happens is, let's say we, we bump along, we don't do that well, uh, and we shut down the company. You're out 12 grand for nothing. Now, it's the same thing as a homeowner, right? Um, you know, you buy a home. And home values, you know, the, the the tax district, you know, the appraisal district tells you a couple of years later, your home has gone up in value by, you know, $25,000. Oh, that's an unrealized gain. You now have to pay taxes on the gain of the value of your home, even though you don't want to move, you're not going to sell the home, <laughs> uh, but you're, now you're paying the IRS unrealized taxes. So if I go back to, again, whatever you tax, you get less of, whatever you subsidize, you get more of. Why? So now we're taxing something that you actually haven't earned yet. It's just because some event says or suggests that your home is worth more than it was or that the, the stock that you acquired is worth more than it was, even though you never sold it. So it, it would be a disaster because what it would do is all of a sudden, why would I invest? Right, like all of my holdings could be, and then, and then by the way, with the tax and unrealized gain, if the value goes down, you get no recovery. Right, if we do a down round and the stock is back at seven dollars a share, it's not like the IRS is going to send you a check. No, you're out the twelve grand, no matter what. So yeah, tax and unrealized gains would be absolutely disastrous across the board, whether you're buying public equities, you know, like stock in IBM or Apple, whether you're investing in private companies, whether you're investing in real estate, it doesn't matter. It's like the one of the worst ideas on the planet. And again, whatever you tax, you get less of. Why do we want to tax investors that are putting capital at risk to add employees, to build housing for those that need housing, you know, to, to help expand our economy. We need investment to create jobs. And so taxing investment makes no sense to me. I'd rather follow the Singapore model of absolutely zero. And that's why it's uh, called this, the economic miracle of Singapore. All right, so next question, please. Great question. Uh, Another question? Okay. Talk, stand up and talk really loud. Uh, how do you report the market to handle economic crisis? Did, did you hear that? So how, no. do, how do free markets handle an economic crisis differently than a state-controlled economy? Oh, so, okay, this is that's a great question. Thanks for bringing that up. Let me explain an example what happened with a big hurricane in Florida. So in a free market, there's no price control, right? There's no price ceilings, there's no price floors. And so what happened was, People were preparing for a hurricane to come to uh, to the to the area, and everyone went to Home Depot or Lowe's to buy plywood to put plywood over their windows to protect their homes, right? And and so what Home Depot and Lowe's did was they just kept ratcheting up the price of the plywood. It's supply and demand. It's a free market. Oh my goodness. Um, 
you know, um, people started buying plywood like in Alabama, filling their pickup truck full of plywood, you know, eight by four plywood sheets and driving it to Florida. So as the price went up, more and more plywood was being driven to Florida by enterprising, you know, folks all over the Mid-South, right? Uh, but it was meeting the demand of plywood. Now, at the time, a lot of people said, oh, this is horrible. Plywood that used to sell for $4 a sheet is now selling for $50 a sheet. <clears throat> but as that price went up, it attracted the supply and plywood is flowing into Florida. And then <clears throat> at the time, they said they put in a price ceiling and said, oh, no, no, no. Plywood has to go back to $4 a sheet of plywood. You can't do that. They did a temporary, you know, sort of order in Florida. This is years ago. And um, guess what happened? No one was willing to drive plywood all the way to Florida for only $4 a sheet. So the supply of plywood dried up completely and no one could get plywood because it wasn't worthwhile to, to move the supply of plywood to Florida. And so many homeowners went without the ability to put plywood over their windows and save their homes. So in a free market response to a disaster is with no price controls, without mucking with the mechanisms of capitalism, the supply flowed to the demand. But the minute they started trying to control the market, the, the supply dried up, demand was not met, and people's homes were destroyed. And so that's a really good example of disaster response, ideally, the market responds quickly with whatever is needed. And in some cases, you, know, you, can, you can imagine the government helping to subsidize might be helpful, but again, there's always unintended consequences. No one realized that at only $4 a sheet of plywood that no one was willing to move plywood to the disaster site. Next question, please. Uh, ESG, is that compatible with the firms of endearment, the idea of running a business uh, compatible with virtue and moral? Well, the problem with what ESG, how ESG is interpreted and how ESG laws or regulations are written. So again, anytime we put regulation in place, we're going to have unintended consequences and we're going to have the, 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 the market masses outsmart that. So ESG, while it has good intentions, it often leads to bad results. So I'll give you an example. Um, part of the, the G is governance. Uh, that's the G of ESG. And the S is social. So in many cases, and I've, I've seen all the regs and all the, all the, the write-ups on this, right? <clears throat> it, the requirement is, for example, as an investor, that a certain percentage of the management team has to be a certain gender or a certain race. And so now what we're trying to do is socially engineer the leadership teams of companies and saying companies that have a more diverse leadership team are in some way going to be rewarded and we're going to punish those that have a management team that's not diverse enough. And that's the, and the problem with that kind of social engineering is that, again, you're messing with the market mechanism. A company will hire the best possible person. So I, I am invested in over 100 companies right now. Everybody hires the best possible person for the job in a free market back and forth of negotiating wage, regardless of, of you know age, gender, race, et cetera. But the minute we try to regulate that, then first of all, it's really, really hard to measure. How do you actually measure that? But now, now why are we putting this performance measure that you have to have this? So what that's going to do then is it's going to mess up a whole bunch of things. First of all, that DEI hire is not sure if they deserve the job. Uh, the other employees aren't sure they deserve the job. And it just leads to a lot of cultural issues within the company. What I would say is what we want to do is go back and say it's not about ESG. It, it's about encouraging, you know, the 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 things that matter. Marriage matters, the family culture matters, character matters, competence matters. We should be encouraging those things. 
We should be going back to elementary school and making sure that kids are learning about real life situations, how to manage money, how to save money, you know, the impact of taxes, how to work hard, you know, um, get in that, get into working part-time jobs, learning the value of money. Those kinds of things would actually grow an economy and help with upward mobility better than any, any kind of social engineering. So simply forcing companies to hire a certain percentage of this or a certain percentage of that doesn't change the world. But if a company's product or service has a value proposition that changes the world, or if that company says, we're going to treat everyone fairly, no matter what our mix of employees or management are, we're going to treat them fairly, we're going to pay them fairly, we're going to be good citizens of society, that's what we want to encourage. So ESG is well-intentioned, but the things that they're trying to measure are the wrong things to measure. Just like oftentimes we tax the wrong things or do the wrong things, even though it's well-intentioned.